Hello and welcome to this review of my AJAZZ AK33 RGB mechanical keyboard. This video is sponsored by GearBest who sent me one for a review. Now this is a bit different from our normal MO because usually it's me who approaches a company for a review and then I ask for a specific model, but this time they approached me and they just sent me something they wanted reviewed. Of course, as always, I told them I'd do the review unbiased, and I think they even wanted to pay me for it, which I declined, because I think that would be a bit of a conflict of interests. Anyway, this keyboard fits nicely in the space-saving streak I'm doing at the moment, which I recently started with this SIIG mini-touch, and it'll get much smaller than this in the upcoming two reviews as well. This keyboard is one of those cheap Cherry MX clone keyboards from China. There are countless ones of these floating around, and they generally cost $40, often plus a discount, including this one. Now, these keyboards are actually quite important, so let me give you a little bit of history. About a year and a half ago, I did a video titled How to Make a Great Gaming Keyboard for $40 or Less, in which I showed how to linear mod a Dell 8101 keyboard, which at the time were common and extremely cheap keyboards that people could barely even give away. Unfortunately and ironically, as soon as I brought out that video, it more or less made itself obsolete because the video was watched a huge number of times, much more than I had anticipated, and all the 8101s were bought up in just a few weeks, raising the price to $80 or even more. So the $40 price tag was right off the cards, even though I kind of already future-proofed that $40 price. I mean, that's more than all my 8101s cost put together. Second, very soon after, the first Chinese clone keyboards hit the market, which also cost about $40 and which didn't necessitate modding or finding an old but good condition 8101 for a reasonable price, further complicating the issue. Not long after that video, I reviewed this Ling Bao, which is one of the first clone boards to be released. Basically, my conclusion at the time was that, while it wasn't a great keyboard, in fact, I still think the 8101 is better in all the ways that matter to me, the $40 price tag for a brand new keyboard with which there was really nothing wrong was almost impossible to beat. Ever since that time, I've acquired about two dozen modern keyboards, and most of them are from well-known brands with worldwide markets such as Corsair, Logitech, Cooler Master, Zolman, etc., with a price tag upwards of $100, and sometimes much more, not counting shipping. And although I won't review those here, I have to say that compared to the $40 Ling Bao, I just don't see where the money is going. They generally aren't that much more well-built than the clone keyboards are, and the switches, often Cherry MX, aren't really better than the clones that the Chinese boards come with. The lighting on many of these isn't really much more impressive either, if that's your thing, so honestly, apart from maybe the styling on one specific board, or perhaps specific functions like macro support, I don't really see how these expensive keyboards can compete with the cheap Chinese ones, really. And the same thing goes for this Ajaz, whose $40 value for money is basically unbeatable by anything that's not a Chinese clone keyboard. Now, I could honestly cut the review short here and leave it at, it's cheap, you can't beat it, but there is an enormous variety of keyboards like this, and the merits are probably basically all the same, but still, let's have a look at what you get when you go for this specific package. For me, there are two things in particular about this keyboard that stand out. For starters, it's a type of 75% keyboard, like the Mini Touch I reviewed recently. In fact, in terms of horizontal length, it's almost exactly the same size as the Mini Touch, although the Mini Touch is a bit deeper. Now, this is funny because I was under the assumption that they didn't really make many 75% keyboards anymore. It's a bit like the Cooler Master I reviewed a while ago that sported a navless layout, which was common in the early 80s, but disappeared quickly after the Model M hit the market, so maybe similarly the Ajaz is a hark back to the past. They market it as an improvement over a full size and a 10 keyless, stating that it's not just an evolution, but a new experience beyond, and that from the structure, the visual to the space of a subversion, which sounds incredible. The 75% form factor is basically a midway between a 60% and a TKL, which most of the Chinese boards offer in an attempt to cater to gamers, and I've commented several times on how I think the 75% is actually a pretty good compromise between space saving and functionality. 
As I mentioned in the Minitouch review, there's many different layouts for 75% form factor keyboards and they all tend to be slightly different, although this one is a relatively conservative layout. I like how it's got the arrow keys in a normal layout, and the control key is in the correct position over here, unlike the Minitouch which placed it basically here. However, the Minitouch has a better system of putting the navigation buttons as a layer over the arrow keys, while the Ajaz more classically puts them in as separate buttons here, which I found are easy to hit accidentally, and the placement relative to each other isn't particularly intuitive. Now one interesting design decision is that they stuck the delete key right here in the top corner and it's a large button too, so you might mistake it for a backspace at first, but that's actually located below it here. Now I use the delete key more or less constantly, especially during video editing, so this is actually pretty useful for me. So as for the layout, I think it's not as good as a full size, but I like it more than a 60% or a TKL. In fact, I might actually keep it on my desk for use during filming and video editing, for which I usually use a separate keyboard. The second thing is the lighting. Now most $40 mechs use monochrome lighting in multiple colors, like the Ling Bao, or multicolor LEDs in three, or if you're lucky, seven colors. But this Ajaz actually has full RGB with 16.5 million colors. Or at least I think it is 16.5 million colors because it says it's full RGB, but at the top of the sales page they say it's 36 million, and below they say it's only 1,680 colors. And what's more, it uses a type of light bundling that's remarkably effective, I mean the colors actually look quite smooth. Now in order to test the quality of the lighting on RGB boards, I've come up with a test that's proven to be really successful so far, and I'm going to demonstrate it using three RGB boards. The Ajaz, a Zolman board, and a Corsair, and I've set them all to yellow, which is made using a combination of red and green light. The idea here is that on mixed colors, such as yellow, on boards that use bad lighting bundling, you'll be able to see the parent colors as separate primary colors, rather than as a single bundled color. You can also use another mixed color like purple, but I prefer yellow, because it's really hard to make yellow look good, and the primary colors really stand out on that, so if the lighting is crappy, it will stand out especially well with yellow. Now here's a comparison between those three boards I showed earlier, and we start off with the Zolman. And although you can see a slight bit of color divergence between the caps, it's actually really good, so the Zolman is an example of a board that has very high quality RGB lighting. Now compare that to this Corsair, and you can immediately see the difference. See, on this one the green and red colors are very easily and separately visible on the fronts of the keycaps. And it really shows when you're using the board too, so this one has very bad light bundling. The Ajaz are somewhere in the middle, but for different reasons. See, when you look at the light, it's actually really smooth and looks well bundled, but on the photo you can still see some separation. And what's more, I found that if I flashed my eyes over the board quickly, you know, just zap over it real quick with my eyes, I could very easily see the separate colors. It's quite ugly, actually. But if I stared at the caps, the yellow looked very well bundled. So I was wondering what was causing this. And this time, it's actually the camera that provides the answer, because as you can see, the Ajaz's light flickers on film, whereas the Zolman and Corsairs don't. Now, of course, in real life, none of these appear to flicker at all, but the fact that the Ajaz does on film seems to indicate that the frequency it uses is much lower than that of the Corsair and the Zolman. And I think that's what causes the light bundling to completely fail when you zap over it with your eyes. So there you go, the backlight on this board is actually pretty decent, especially for $40. Better than the Corsairs for sure, but it's not as good as the Zolmans. So if you do get it, I'd stick to moving patterns or primary colors, because that makes the light divergence stand out less. You can download external software to customize the lighting on the keyboard, and I assume that the names for the patterns are literally translated from Chinese, because they're really flowery and poetic, like go with the stream, or clouds fly, or even snow winter jasmine. A short run through the rest of the keyboard, which otherwise is really generic, so I won't have to go into too much detail. The build quality is okay, but it's nothing special, although I do like the little non-slip pads at the bottom of the flip-out feet. 
It weighs only about 550 grams, which is not a lot even for a keyboard this small, especially since it boasts of a metal plate, which is, according to the website, very durable. But it weighs even less than a mini touch, and that board is built, let's say, questionably. It does have a detachable mini USB cable as well as N key rollover though, so you can press as many buttons at the same time as you want. It uses blue clicky switches which are branded AJAZ but they're made by ZT who apparently also does Zorro switches. And although they wouldn't tell me more details about them, they feel and especially sound basically like Utamu's or perhaps Gatorons. So they're nothing special, just generic MX clone switches really. The loud, shrill click of these switches is amplified by the floating open case design. It's very typical of these Chinese boards. In fact, you can often instantly identify such cheap clone boards by this noise alone. I mean, in terms of sound, it's crap enough that it arguably makes MX Blue sound like fucking Beethoven. Listen to this. As for the keycaps, according to the GearBest website, express yourself with programmable advanced circular retro double color injection cap, but they look just like laser ablated ABS caps to me, so I don't know what that's all about. The only difference is that the lettering looks a little bit silvery, so maybe they top coated it with a thin layer of some material, although the light does shine through it when it's darker. Now one problem I found with laser ablated caps like these, which are on the vast majority of gamer keyboards nowadays, is that they have a very smooth surface from the UV treatment used to colour them black afterwards, and because they're black this results in fingerprints really standing out in them as soon as you touch them even just once. Now, after you've used them for a few hours, that already looks pretty gross. And furthermore, laser ablated lettering is not very durable, and you can get holes in the lettering in just a few years' time. This is an example of what the keycaps on this board looked like after mere hours of use. Compare that to the lesser used keycaps on the same board, and you can see that it really stands out. But at least, thankfully, the keycaps do use a normal font as opposed to basically every other gamer keyboard ever made. So, concluding, what I think is that if you want to buy a modern mechanical keyboard, get a cheap Chinese clone board, because there's no way A-list brands can beat them for their price. If you want cheap but decent RGB and or a modern keyboard with a 75% layout, this one might well be a good choice for you. In fact, I think it's a pretty okay board, but apart from those two things, this board is really nothing special. See, although they're excellent value for money, the danger of marketing a clone board is of course that the there's very little to set them apart from all the other clones. I will say that if you're on the lookout for a small board but don't give a shit about all that gaming crap, then the Mini Touch is probably a much better board overall. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and join me next time when we look at an even smaller keyboard. In the meantime, here is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.